Okay, today we're gonna to talk about Francis Bacon's The Great Instauration. What's an instauration? Good question. It's kind of like a renovation or maybe a refounding. And what is it that Bacon wants to renovate? What is it he wants to refound? Just all the arts and sciences, that's all. But that's not the most incredible thing. The most incredible thing is that he succeeds. Bacon is, of course, one of the most important thinkers in early modern European history. He is widely regarded as the architect of the scientific method. But the foundation, the installation of the scientific method is an enormous undertaking. It requires a kind of philosophical and intellectual revolution, an overturning of everything that's come before. And it's this project that Bacon talks about in The Great Instauration. Now, Bacon addresses The Great Instauration to King James, and this is an important detail because Bacon understands that he's not going to be undertaking this project alone. This is actually a sign of how innovative Bacon's project is. On the one hand, at the beginning of this whole thing, he says that he wrote this down because he thought the present and the future could benefit from hearing his thoughts. So he's got no lack of confidence. On the other hand, Bacon seems to understand himself merely as a link in a chain. And his contributions are merely one part of what he understands to be really a national maybe an international project. So one of the innovative things here is that Bacon is thinking about science as a collective enterprise, not as the work of an individual genius or great thinker. And he's among the first to reconceptualize science in that way. Throughout this work, Bacon comes back to the image of foundations again and again. And his argument is that all of human arts and sciences are built upon a faulty foundation. For Bacon, knowledge is built on the works and thoughts of these various influential philosophers. And these thinkers all have different first premises and methods. So the result is that the intellectual tradition we've inherited is kind of a mess. He thinks we need to go back to the beginning, to start over with better foundations upon which we can build more secure and stable knowledge. Now Bacon has a few problems with contemporary philosophy. He says in part that it's mostly productive of controversies, arguments. Mostly what it's good for right now is that scholars just argue about stuff. And in fact, the same things they've been arguing about forever. He says the philosophers and scholars of his day, their work, it's fruitful of controversies, but barren of works. That is to say, philosophy, natural science, it doesn't really produce things of benefit or use for human beings. This image of fertility or fruitfulness is another really important one for Bacon. He imagines that human knowledge should be productive. And he arrives at this position on natural philosophy or philosophy in part by looking at the mechanical arts. Bacon says, hey, look at technology. It's progressing all the time. We're inventing new things every day that make our lives better. Where are the new philosophies or the new answers that are solving ethical, moral, and intellectual problems for us. We just seem to be forever circling around the same questions, arguing about what justice is. Does God exist? Do humans have free will? It's the same thing over and over and over again. We're not making any progress. He says that philosophy and the intellectual sciences stand like statues, worshiped and celebrated, but not moved or advanced. Now, one of the problems facing Bacon is he's challenging authority and some pretty authoritative authorities. Bacon's taking on people like Aristotle. In the 1600s, almost 2,000 years after Aristotle's death, Aristotle remained the dominant figure in science, in natural history. And in the early modern period especially, maybe even more than now, there was a lot of reverence for authority. Scholarly arguments were often rooted in authority. Who was the authority you could point to to verify your claims? If Aristotle or Cicero or Plutarch said a thing, then it was more likely to be true. If it could be found in the Bible, it was more likely to be true. So Bacon, in a sense, is trying to upend all of this, this widespread belief in the authority of these famous thinkers. And Bacon's claim, his main proposition, is that we need a new foundation for the study of nature, especially. And that foundation needs to be based on experiential knowledge, empirical study of the natural world. So Bacon's scientific method is gonna be based on empirical observation, but it's not just gonna be impressionistic, right? We need to be skeptical of what our senses are telling us. And so we need to structure our investigations with rigorous, methodical experiments. It's through these repeatable, falsifiable experiments that we'll arrive at scientific truth. And Bacon says, up until now, we've had people undertake empirical studies of particular things, right? To answer particular questions, but there's no regulated system of empirical study that governs all of our studies. 
And it's this kind of overarching system that Bacon is trying to establish. Now, there's a couple of interesting allusions in the middle of this thing that I want to look at, and that'll open up some questions. At one point, Bacon talks about Adam and Eve. And this is significant because you may remember in the book of Genesis, humanity is expelled from the garden because they pursue a certain kind of prohibited knowledge. For it was not that pure and uncorrupted natural knowledge whereby Adam gave names to the creatures according to their propriety, which gave occasion to the fall. It was the ambitious and proud desire of moral knowledge to judge of good and evil, to the end that man may revolt from God and give laws to himself, which was the form and manner of the temptation. So at one point in paradise, God assigns to Adam the task of naming all the animals, and he does so. And Bacon says there we see an appropriate representation of humanity's relationship to nature. Maybe it's an image of humanity cataloging natural things. Humanity gets itself into trouble when they pursue a kind of knowledge that would allow them to make their own laws, maybe to define their own limits. That, Bacon suggests here, is the temptation that needs to be avoided. Bacon also talks about fallen angels, and he says that, well, they fell because of an inappropriate lust for power that did not belong to them. So it seems Bacon is conscious that the real temptation of this new kind of knowledge, this scientific knowledge, is that insofar as it's about producing works, benefits for human life, it could also be understood as expanding human power over the natural world. And is there a kind of power that's inappropriate to us? Could we go too far? Are there limits we should not cross? And I think this leads us to a number of interesting questions about Bacon's project more generally. Is it the case that all human knowledge ought to be productive? Can every human problem be solved in the same way we can solve a mechanical problem? Or is it the case that we argue about justice, we worry about mortality, simply because that's part of the human condition? Maybe those are problems that just won't go away. Maybe arguing about what justice is, or whether or not we're free, or what God wants from us, maybe those are just elements of being a human. Another question that may or may not occur to you, it might be counterintuitive, is it the case that we should always be looking for more to accumulate more goods, to expand our power? Is that a good thing? You know, when we look at our increased technological capacities from the Industrial Revolution on, and we look at what it's done to our planet, can we say, simply and unequivocally, that these expanded powers, these expanded capacities, have been good for human beings? One counter-argument might be that being a human being and philosophy is about coming to understand what our natural limits are and learning how to live within those limits, within those boundaries, not perpetually expanding them. These are important things to think about. Thanks again.